Hey again, everyone. Um, in my first video, I did a bit of a simulation and sort of explanation of the ultraviolet catastrophe with a bit of history behind it. Um, today, we're going to jump straight into the math and the, uh, the derivation of the problem. Okay, so without further ado, um, we already know that we have this box, this theoretical box. Um, a couple things I didn't say in the last video. Um, this box likely exists in the vacuum of space, okay? Um, there is matter inside the box, and let's just say there's gas. Let's just say there's, there's gas particles flying around here. This will be important when we, when we say that this thing is at thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, and the internal heat and the internal temperature of this thing is not changing. Um, but the thing we said in the last video is that everywhere along the edges, the electric field is zero. Okay, so this is our this is our cube in space, and this is the object that we're going to. The goal of this is to say, okay, there are these standing waves set up inside here. Okay, like I like I showed in the simulation, there's standing waves set up inside this cube. Um, how does this energy radiate out? How does this energy radiate out if it's in thermal equilibrium? Okay, so we know this thing's going to have to emit radiation somehow. In what way does it do so? So that's what we're going to dive into today, and, and we'll see where it leads us. The first thing we're going to write down is the, uh, the wave equation, which some of you may be familiar with. But in general, it's, it's a partial differential equation that um, is true for, um, it's generally true for any wave. So of course, in the case of an electric field, we're going to use a standing wave inside this box. Okay, so that's that's sort of the first thing we'll note, and we'll we'll come back to this. We we can observe that since we are saying that there are electromagnetic waves, standing waves, setting up inside this box, we know that this is going to be true. Um, another thing we can observe is that standing waves have a particular format. And there's, you, you can look at Fourier series expansions and solve for coefficients, but there's a very simple way to establish the equation as well. And that I'm going to say that E, which in general is a function of X, Y, Z, and T, um, has some amplitude, E0, but I'm going to say it's a sine function of some component of X, sine of something of Y, sine something of Z, cosine something ah let's say sine let's say sine doesn't matter sine of t okay so what what are these little things in here normally we would see the wave vector and in case any of you aren't familiar if you have a wave propagating say in this direction and there's this propagation of this wave and there might also be a, a magnetic field component to this thing okay this is a common representation we see um, the wave vector would be a vector that points in the direction of propagation. Okay, so K would point in this direction, and K would have the property that its magnitude is equal to 2 pi over the wavelength. Now, obviously these are standing waves, so a direction of propagation doesn't make sense. But what we're going to do as sort of a stand-in is we're going to say the X component of K, the Y component of K, the Z component of K. And then for this guy over here, it's just omega t for the frequency. So a couple definitions here will be helpful. Um, omega is equal to 2 pi f, 2 pi mu, if you will, for the frequency. And the frequency, remember this is an electromagnetic wave, so we know it propagates at the speed of light. Um, so v, uh, mu, sorry, the frequency, is going to be, let me make sure I get this right, it's c meters per second divided by lambda wavelength. Okay, so we've got some relationships here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to see that for standing modes, there's some sort, there's a special geometrical relationship between these guys somehow. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to get to in this video. So there's one more relationship we need to establish, and that is of the standing waves in this box, okay? So if you look at any particular um, wall, any particular wall, you will see that for that length, and let's assume that we have a wave set up like this, 
think you and I can both agree that this field is zero at both of the edges. And what we can say in this case, let's call this n equals one, is that you get, um, well, the length is clearly equal to half a wavelength. Okay, so what about the second mode of a standing wave? And anyone who's seen standing waves before, this is very, very standard, but I just wanted to go through it quickly. Well, in this case, the length, which is the length that I've drawn here, is clearly equal to a full wavelength lambda. Anyways, the pattern, this continues, the pattern is that L equals N lambda over two. So this is a further observation that we can make um, about, about this system. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're gonna plug um, our wave equation, um, sorry, our electromagnetic field or e, or e field into our wave equation and we'll see what we get. I'm gonna do it sort of in a shorthanded way. Um, and what I want, I wanna do it sort of graphically. So if you take the derivative of sine, so if I take the derivative, I'm gonna use some weird notation here. Um, let's say there's a, a derivative of sine obviously gives us cosine. And then the derivative of this cosine, okay, the derivative of that cosine gives us a negative sine back. So the, the overall interaction of this double derivative of all these sine terms gives us a negative sine plus the chain rule. We're going to get whatever's inside there. So to do the first term, d squared um, e by dx squared, maybe I'll do them in colored. We're going to get, well, um, kx is going to come out and it's going to come out twice. So you actually get kx squared. Um, the eo E naught is unchanged and it's a negative. Okay, so you get a negative. What I'm going to do, and remember this is a partial derivative, so all of the other terms are also there as well. So we get sine um, kx, x, and so on. All the rest of the terms are still there. Okay, so then let's do our second term in white. Um, our second term is the second derivative of this guy, or with respect to y. So it's it's literally it's going to be the same pattern repeated, e naught k y squared um, sine k y y, and then all the rest of the stuff. The the other untouched stuff comes back, and then the third one is going to be this this derivative with respect to this, and you get minus e naught k z squared sine k z z and then the rest of the equation. Okay, so uh, let's do the, the last one in blue, the, the other side of the equation. We get one over c squared, and then I made a bit of a mistake here, I think. Does that, no, that, that's fine. So this, this E naught is there. Okay, so the partial um, with omega, it's, a, it's the same thing again, actually. So we get, we will get, it'll be, be negative e naught over c squared times omega squared and then uh, sine omega t plus all the other stuff that was untouched okay so this this is how I'm sort of quickly doing these derivatives but of course we see obviously a lot of stuff happens um, all of these terms cancel so this cancels all the negatives cancel these guys cancel and so on. So at the end, we're actually not left with very much. This guy's gone. That's gone. At the end, all we are left with is kx squared, which once again, this is a weird concept, the x component of the k vector, um, kz squared. And we're going to show something here that's not surprising at all, actually. Um, it's omega squared over c squared. Now, okay, what else do we know about omega? Um, Omega, we're going to try to get this back into a format for, for this. We want to see magnitude k. Well, let's do it another way. I'll, I'll show this to you in a, another way. We're going to take this guy and square it, and I'll just, we'll do, we'll work in reverse because it's easier. What's the magnitude of k squared? Well, it's um, 4 pi squared over lambda squared. Okay, so this is 2 pi um frequency mu so it's c over lambda and then c is actually equal to um 
let's say lambda. Oh, we can leave that as C. We can leave it as C because what's going on, so this is squared and this is squared. And what do we notice? This is gone, this is gone, and sure enough, we get this thing equaling four pi squared over lambda squared, which is what's inside here, okay? So, all right, what, what have we shown? We haven't really <laughs> shown anything too interesting yet. What we've shown is that k x squared plus k y squared plus k z squared equals k squared. Okay, surprise, surprise, k is a vector. This is probably something we already would have known if it was a vector of three components. Um, but what we want to do is we want to plug in these sort of fictitious definitions for um, for lambda. Okay, so if this is two pi, maybe I should clarify this a little bit. This is length, and this is lambda x. This is n x lambda x. So these are sort of funny, funny definitions. You don't normally hear about a wavelength x component or an x component of a mode, um, but we're going to see how this is useful in a second. So this is clearly 2 pi over lambda x squared plus 2 pi over lambda y squared plus 2 pi over lambda z squared um, equals 2 pi over lambda squared. All right, and we also have relationships. Let's take this relationship and work it out one step further we will get um, lambda x equals 2L over nx. Okay, so um, first of all, we're gonna cancel all of these pi's. We're gonna get rid of those. And what we're left with is on the bottom, we get 2L over nx squared plus 2L over ny squared plus 2L over NZ squared equals, and then this guy is going to be, well, it's, this is our standard definition. It's 2L over N squared. So, and this, this um, let's make a quick note here. This, this final one, this would be for a normal wave, a normal, I didn't write that very clearly, a normal wave we can observe this 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 n this standing wave n but we've sort of fictitiously created these um, but they're not they're not so fictitious as we'll see soon because they they will correspond to the mode of each side of the the container um, so obviously these l's drop out completely and we are left with n x squared plus n y squared plus n z squared equals n squared okay this is the first sort of important result because it motivates us, this result motivates us to think of the modes of these standing waves in n space, in some sort of n space, okay? So um, let me just quickly draw this out. If you had a, a graph that showed, um, uh, let's call this nx, ny, and nz, now we have a space where these modes exist. Well, there's a few things that are, that are obvious. First of all, nx is greater than zero, ny, uh, I guess equal to, greater than or equal to zero, and nz is greater, greater than or equal to zero. So there's only, the only part of this space is actually valid, right? So maybe if you were to sort of kind of sketch it out, it would be this sort of front um, cube is, is valid space for this region. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this one here. Um, in the next video, we are going to dive into this a bit further and see what sort of relationships we can, can look at with, with this N.